I'm Josh Benner, and welcome to this episode of Today's Faith Matters. In this episode, we talk about a theological debate that's been raging over the last few years within evangelical circles. Last year, popular theologian Wayne Grudem came out with a revised and updated version of his popular 1994 systematic theology. In this new version, Grudem gives further elaboration to a theological topic that he's been discussing now over the past several years, which he calls eternal functional subordination. In part, that's the idea that Jesus the Son is eternally and forever subordinate to God the Father. My guest, Tony Arsenal, and I both see issues with Grudem's views on this matter, believing primarily and most importantly that this view is not biblical, that it has theological issues, and that it goes against the history of the church teaching on the doctrine of the Trinity, and that Grudem's view ultimately leads into a heresy which is essentially as old as the church, known as Arianism, which basically relegates Jesus to a lesser form of deity than God the Father. Tony hosts a podcast that delves into theological and doctrinal issues called Reformed Brotherhood. He's the co-host of that, and I know I've benefited a lot from his explanations and teaching through that podcast. He has degrees from Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary in Theology and Church History. And I was so excited to be able to have this conversation with Tony where we talk about the recent developments in this doctrinal issue. We talk about the historical problems with interpreting the Trinity in the way that Grudem does, and also Grudem's misuse of sources. This is the first of a two-part episode and interview I did with Tony, and I was so appreciative of Tony's time and the opportunity to talk to him about this very important theological issue. If we get the doctrine of the Trinity wrong, that will lead us wrong in every other major doctrinal issue. It impacts our understanding of Jesus and who he is. It impacts our understanding of God and how the triune God exists within his own nature, and it impacts the gospel itself and what it is that we're believing in. Any theology that relegates Jesus or subordinates him to the Father uh, is something that really needs to be carefully investigated and explained. And so in this conversation, I hope that we are clear in some of the reasons as to why this is such a problematic view that Wayne Grudem has. Thanks so much, and I hope you enjoy our conversation. Tony, sincerely, I want to thank you so much for your time and for joining me today. Yeah, thanks for having me on. And before we begin, I don't say this out of flattery, but having listened to your podcast and written things you've read, in all sincerity, you truly have a gift for explaining very complicated theological issues. And I know that I personally really learned a lot from you, and I'm just very appreciative of your study and how uh, the Lord has gifted you to to communicate truth. Oh, well, thank you. That, that's very encouraging. Thanks for saying that. So the discussion we're talking about today is um, the doctrine of eternal subordination, eternal functional subordination. It has about four different names. Yeah. Um, and part of the reason why I think this is especially relevant right now is because Wayne Grudem has updated his systematic theology, and he has a much longer section dealing with this discussion and other Trinitarian issues. And so or I'd be curious to begin is just kind of the recent history of the development of this doctrine. Yeah, so this um, this doctrine, which, as you said, it, it comes by different names, um, Grudem's favored uh title seems to be eternal functional subordination. Sometimes you hear it called eternal subordination of the son. Um, you know, there's, there's eternal relations of authority and submission. So it goes by all these different names. Um, but the, the, the history of it, and, and this is a little bit disputed, it, you know, if you ask the EFS advocates, um, they will tell you, it just comes out of the Bible, that this is just the theology that they got from reading and studying the Bible. Um, but I, I think, and I think it's been demonstrated by a number of people, if you look at the uh, actual development of the doctrine and the timing of the development of the doctrine, it seems to be a response um, to a certain kind of um, movement that Grudem calls evangelical feminism. Um, it, it's probably more commonly called uh, egalitarianism. 
And so more or less what, what happened is kind of back in this, the late seventies, early eighties, um, the, this, this Christian feminist movement or this egalitarian movement, which wasn't brand new, but it was really picking up steam. They started to level critiques against complementarians saying more or less that if you hold a theology that says that women um, in any real sense by nature are uh, subordinate or subject to men um, by nature, then you are postulating some sort of difference in the fundamental nature. And you're making men and women uh, in the most kind of like surface level way, you might be making them human in a different way from each other. But on a more radical level, some of them would actually say you're making women almost subhuman in reference to men. And so the, the, uh, the book, uh, Biblical Manhood and Womanhood comes out, which was, um, it was a collection of essays, um, which was edited by Wayne Grudem and John Piper. And I, I honestly, I haven't read that book in its entirety, but it was really kind of a bombshell on the scene. And in this book, Wayne Grudem starts to forward this theology um, and, and also in his systematic theology, which came out, you know, kind of a similar time frame, where he's arguing that the persons of uh, the Godhead, the Father and the Son specifically, and then kind of by extension, uh, the Holy Spirit, that there's this hierarchy of relations in the Trinity, and that the, the Son uh, is, see, it's even hard to speak up about this without using language that I think they would deny, um, and I think we'll get into why that is later, but the Son is subordinate to uh, the Father. And that's not a thing that happens as a result of the incarnation. It's not a, a thing that happens as a result of the outward workings of the Trinity or the economy of the Trinity. It, it's something fundamental to what it means to be God, that the Father is an authority over the Son and the Son is subordinate or is a, a subject of the Father. And so they start to work out this theology and the argument goes, and he makes this argument in, in this second edition, he, in, in this section, the argument then goes that if, if we can have this uh, gradation of authority and submission, this relation of eternal authority and submission in the Trinity, then it follows that men and women created in the image of God, uh, that there could be a, a sort of foundational subordination of, of women to men without a difference in dignity and honor. And so that, that's the argument that they're forwarding. Um, you know, that, that actually stayed relatively quiet for like 20 years. Uh, it, it wasn't something that was discussed all that much. When it did, it kind of flared up in the academy a little bit. And as this, and this is why I think it's important to a, kind of a general audience, you know, a lot of people think about the Trinity and they're like, yeah, well, it's an article of the faith, so we should do our best to understand it. But these sort of nuanced arguments or these different views, they don't, they don't matter all that much. Well, what happens is Wayne Grudem and D.A. Carson and Bruce Ware are all very influential, influential in sort of evangelical um, thinking. And so their work starts to work its way into popular evangelical publications. And when I say popular, I don't mean like really widespread, although they were. I mean popular in the technical sense that it's they're written for the popular, the people, for the, for the kind of average person in the pew. So things like the ESV study Bible, the ESV translation itself, um, the NIV study Bible, and anything that these men or their colleagues were involved in writing, anything where it touches on the Trinity or gender relations between, particularly between husband and wife, this theology kind of works its way into that. So much so that when you start to look for it, all of a sudden you see it everywhere. When, when, you're, when you're attuned to this errant way of thinking about the Trinity, all of a sudden it starts to pop up everywhere. And so uh, what, what ended up happening uh, is a pastor in Philadelphia uh, named Leon Gallagher was working his way. He was preaching through John, you know, expositionally, and he was using D.A. Carson's uh, commentary in the Pillar Commentary series, which uh, other than this issue is a very good commentary. I've, I've used it in the past. It was one of the textbooks for my Gospel of John course in seminary. Um, and he started to observe this eternal function of subordination theme. Now, Liam is a kind of a, a classic American Presbyterian preacher um, who who probably just didn't use this resource that much. He probably wasn't using these popular evangelical resources as much. He was probably more involved in classical reformed, you know, commentaries and, and sort of the more reformed publishing world. 
And so as he starts to notice this, he becomes very concerned. And so he uh, he posts a blog post to a- a- Amy Bird's uh, blog, which at the time was with the Alliance of Confessing Evangelicals. Um, she she has since parted ways with uh, the Alliance, no longer blogs with them, but his his articles were published on her blog post. And it was a series of articles that honestly were, were aggressive. They, they were meant to start a fight. He came out and he picked a fight with Wayne Grudem and Bruce Ware because, as you said, this theology is important. And so in the summer of 2016, this kind of comes to a boil. There's a, you know, there's blog posts and podcasts and, and things going back and forth. And it, it kind of died down a little bit after the ETS conference, the Evangelical Theological Society conference that year. And at that conference, Wayne Grudem presented a paper. Uh, he was one of the keynote speakers. He presented a paper where two significant things happened. The first significant thing happened is that he reversed his theology on a subject called the eternal generation of the sun. And the second thing was he doubled down on his theology about the eternal functional subordination. And I was not there. I haven't listened to the addresses, but but people who were there have told me, uh, he essentially said, you know, if, if you have a problem with this, your problem is not with me. It's with the apostle Paul. It's with Jesus. It's with the Bible. And so when you come out with a statement that's that strong, uh, people kind of tend to throw their hands up and go, well, we, we tried, we, you know, we tried, we tried to have rational conversation. Um, you know, since then, a couple books have come out. Glenn Butner, uh, who's a, 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 was a small figure in the beginning of this controversy, and he's become a little bit more of a significant voice as it's gone along. Um, and I've, I've spoken with Glenn. Glenn is a, an awesome guy. He loves the Lord. He's a, he's a um, professor. I'm not sure what school he's at, but he, um, he wrote a book um, that was very good. There's been a couple other uh, book length um, treatments. There's been a few uh, collections of essays that touch on this, but for the most part, there hasn't been a significant publishing uh, amount. And so that brings us to basically today um, when Wayne Grudem's second edition of the Smith Theology comes out. And in this book, um, he lays out a full, you know, it's not a full chapter, but it's probably about 50% of his Trinity chapter is, is dedicated to clarifying and forwarding and advocating this argument and, and in some ways defending against the criticisms that he's received. So this is, this is kind of, in my mind, you know, you have this hierarchy of stable communications, right? There's, there's kind of like back and forth conversations that aren't super stable. You can only recall them anecdotally. People's, you know, the telephone game happens. He said, she said kind of stuff. Then you have things like blog articles, which can very easily get changed. Blogs get moved. So that kind of stuff is not there. And in those vehicles of conversation and, and communication, um, and then maybe you have like a podcast because it's recorded in a certain way and it's less likely to disappear than, than like a blog article is. Those vehicles of communication, I tend to hold those things relatively loosely because those are usually off the cuff. They're not as well thought out. They're not peer reviewed. They're not edited in the same way. But now what we have his, what we might think is of as kind of the mature statement of Wayne Grudem on this theology, at least so far, in a stable, it's there forever, it's been proofread, it's been edited, it's gotten past um, you know, peer review and editing, it's there now. So I'm glad that you you wanted to talk about this because I think it's, it's the right time um, to sort of reignite the controversy, it, to put it in one sense. Because I think that this is a theology that needs to be addressed. Uh, it needs to be addressed firmly. And, and, you know, I, I want to be cautious how I say this. The reason it needs to be addressed is because these are matters that involve salvation. You, you, um, you see out there that sometimes people, they kind of want to reduce the Christian faith to some sort of vague trust in some sort of thing that's out there, right? As long as you have faith in Jesus, then, then you're saved. And obviously, you know, I'm a reformed Christian faith, you know, salvation through faith alone is like my, you know, it's my motto. Uh, it's, it's everything, but faith classically understood has a knowledge component. There's a set of facts that we have to affirm are true in order for faith to be faith in the right thing. Um, the analogy that my, uh, my pastor used to use, I grew up in Minneapolis. So, so walking on frozen lakes was a, you know, a pretty common occurrence. And whether the, whether the ice is two inches thick or 20 inches thick, um, that's, what, that's what makes the difference. It doesn't matter how much you trust the ice. If the ice is only an inch thick, you're going through, no matter how much you trust it. But if the ice is 20 inches thick, it doesn't matter how unsure you are, you're not going through. 
So it's, it's the, the thing that you're resting your faith upon that's important, not necessarily your faith itself. And so if your faith is rested upon a false set of facts about who God is, about how he saves us, about how the atonement works, um, and you know, there, there are things that are more central to that thesis than not. But the Trinity is one of those things that the facts about the Trinity, there's a certain set of facts that we must affirm. And Wayne Grudem's theology stands outside of those facts. I'm not saying Wayne Grudem's not saved. I don't, I don't know that. I, I don't have any knowledge of his heart. I have no way to know that. But the theology that he's advocated, if com- consistently affirmed and consistently held, leads you to a false God who cannot save you. So I, I think it's important. And I think because this just came out, it's the right time to talk about it. Because there's going to be a lot of people who are getting their hands on his theology for the first time that maybe haven't heard about it before. And Wayne Grudem's Systematic Theology tends to be one of those books that people who are new to the faith, who are new to thinking about theology in this way, this is the book they go to. And so a lot of times those folks who are already sort of a little bit um, fragile in terms of their faith, they're still, you know, as Paul would say, they're still drinking milk. This is poison milk. So we need to be careful to make sure we kind of caution them away from it and answer, answer the theology that's put forward. Thank you very much for that. And uh, yeah, there's so much to, to consider with, uh, with with what you've just said. And I appreciate how you've outlined the, the recent debate and discussion. I think one of the first places I'd like to go based on all of that is in Grudem's New Systematic Theology, because I, I agree with everything you said. Um, you know, I, I think about things like the Nicene Creed and, and just the historical Orthodox views of the Trinity, and that Grudem would argue that he's teaching just in line with all of that. Yeah, and I'd be curious what your response is to that, and and because I don't know if there's anything specific in like the Nicene Creed or the Chalcedonian Creed or the Athanasian Creed that he specifically says I don't believe this. Right. Yeah, I think the issue is more the logical conclusions of his theology disagree with that. Right. Yeah. And, and so there's two, two things to remember, um, kind of touching on that. The first thing is that him saying uh, there's nothing in the Nicene Creed that I disagree with is a new thing, right? Because because he did, uh, in his first edition, he had a whole section of the book critiquing the idea of eternal generation. So the fact that Wayne Grudem now um, says he affirms the Nicene Creed, it, it really just shows he is above the creed in terms of how he thinks about things. The creed, uh, and and therefore, in some senses, the historic Christian faith and the, the faith once handed down to the saints delivered through the ages as represented in the creedal and confessional statements of the church. Um, he has set himself above that, um, whether he agrees with it or not. Um, and and it's, it's true that in some senses, all Christians have to assess the creeds. But the fact that he now is able to say, well, there's nothing I disagree with is not all that impressive to me because it was only just a few years ago that he would not have been able to say that. And in fact, explicitly said that the contrary. The second thing to remember is that um, there are all sorts of heretical movements throughout the history of the church that would say, I agree with this creed or that creed. Um, the Nicene Creed itself had to be a- adapted and updated because the original creed of Nicaea, which was written and drafted at the Council of Nicaea in 325, the original creed was not specific enough to exclude exclude some of the Arians. And they were able to say a few years later, uh, yeah, oh yeah, I'm fine with the creed. And so they had to then go back and revise this creed in order to clarify what it meant in order to say, well, no, I know you say you agree with it, but what you actually are, are teaching doesn't agree with it. So when we look at a, a person's statement, um, When someone is willing to explicitly say, I disagree with what the historic church has always taught, that's a very concerning thing to say. But even if someone says, I don't disagree with what the historic church has always taught, that statement in itself is easy to make. What's more difficult is is to actually demonstrate through your scholarship and through what you teach and through what you write that you do. And so I think, you know, that is kind of a, a red herring in the debate to say, well, we all affirm the Nicene Creed. Well, Liam Gallagher, Carl Truman, Todd Pruitt, that whole group, myself, um, you know, you, I think, 
we would say, well, no, no, you don't. Like we, we, we both believe different things about, about this topic. And we all believe that the Nicene Creed on some level speaks to this topic. So, so we have to parse out what, what do we mean? What do you mean? What does the creed mean? And I think one of the things we're going to get to later is, is Wayne Grudem, um, he has demonstrated through the course of this debate, and then I think in, in some pretty stark ways in this, this chapter, he's demonstrated that he doesn't actually have a good competency in understanding and assessing historical sources. And so for him to say, um, you know, I, yeah, I believe what the creed says. I'm not 100% confident that Wayne Grudem actually understands what the creed says. And so there, there's that two stage thing is one, do you understand what the creed is actually teaching? And two, does your teaching substantially agree with that? I don't think either of those propositions are true about Wayne Grudem. I, I don't think he understands the theology of the creed or the, the Nicene fathers, the patristics who, who wrote this stuff. And then even if he does, I don't think that the substance of the theology that he's teaching lines up with the substance of what the Nicene Creed is trying to say. It's interesting. Um, and, and again, I, I appreciate that, that clarification and, and perspective as well. Um, I, I can't help but think about a, a mentor when I was in college who talked about studying the Bible. And he said, if, if you come to an interpretation that nobody else has ever had before, it's wrong. And I think in general, that's probably pretty good, uh, good wisdom. And I think about the gymnastics that they had to go through to create some of these arguments and analogies to marriage. Yeah. Um, and just the stretches that they had to go to, to, uh, again, to arguments that are not the historical, historically understood uh, teachings within the churches. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and, you know, I think one of the things that's telling in this debate is part of Wayne Grudem's methodology, right? In the first chapter of his systematic theology, he sets out his methodology of how he's going to do theology. And this is paraphrasing, but he more or less says what, what you do is you take, you take all of the, the verses, discrete verses in the Bible that speak about your topic. You line them all up. And then there's always going to be a, a few verses that speak about your topic, but seem to say something a little bit different. So, so the primary work that Wayne Grudem thinks systematic theology is, is taking those kind of outlier verses and synthesizing them into, you know, these other verses. And that in itself is not necessarily a terrible thing to do. You know, we, we have to do that. That's just part of it. You know, I've got, I've got a bunch of verses that say there's one God and only one God. And then I have um, comparatively less verses that talk about Jesus and the Holy Spirit as, as God. So I have to take those verses in the New Testament that, that indicate that Jesus and the Holy Spirit are also God. I have to take those and read them and understand what they mean in light of the fact that there's only one God. So I don't want to get too hard on him. But he says in his uh, chapter that, that the understanding of historical theology Basically, historical theology doesn't matter. It doesn't really make a difference what other Christians throughout the history of the church have said in terms of understanding what the Bible says. And again, on one level, that, that's true. What, what John Calvin said about what Paul taught doesn't have anything, doesn't really teach anything about what Paul, what Paul taught. Calvin came, you know, 1500 years later. He couldn't have influenced what Paul thought. But the history of the church is, is I think it was Spurgeon, I, I could be wrong, but I think it was Spurgeon who said something along the lines of, you know, it would be silly for us to think that the Holy Spirit stopped working the book of Acts. You know, he, he continued to work through his people, not in, he's not inspiring new scriptures. There's no new, there's no new prophets or apostles or anything like that, but it, he didn't abandon his church. He's not, a, you know, God is not a deist God where, where the Holy Spirit inspires the scripture and sets up the church and then just leaves it alone for, for a thousand years or two, 2000 years until the charismatics come back in, you know, in, in 1980. So, so it's kind of, it's sort of one of those strange things where he doesn't have a lot of use for historical theology for the historical statements of the church until all of a sudden people start saying, well, your, your theology is just not in line with what the church is taught. Now, all of a sudden, he starts pulling in all these quotes, pulling in all this thought. Um, and that's why I say, like, I'm not sure that he's competent to understand the Nicene Creed, because if you even if you just look at this one chapter on the Trinity, 
up until you get to the point where uh, he starts to talk about the eternal functional subordination. There's really not a whole lot of, of historical citations or sources throughout the rest of the chapter. It's just not part of his method. Once you get to this and he has to sort of defend against this critique that you're teaching something different than, than what the church has taught. And, and when we say that, we're not giving the church some sort of some sort of special teaching authority, right? There is a ministerial teaching authority in the church. It's not a magisterial teaching authority. We're not Roman Catholics, but there is a ministerial teaching authority that the church has authority to faithfully proclaim that which the Bible teaches. But we have to be cautious because we, we shouldn't give the church this elevated status of some sort of infallible teaching. But at the same time, to say in essence that the, the bulk or the majority of the history of the church has taught A, but I came along 2000 years later and I looked at the Bible with fresh eyes and, and I'm going to teach B, um, that is essentially the criticism that people leveled against him. That kind, almost kind of like, who do you think you are? Right? Who, who do you think you are that people like John Calvin, people like Augustine, people like Athanasius got this wrong and somehow you came along and got it right? Um, and so his response is to line up this, this list of quotes to, to sort of assess different, different historical sources and pull out people that he believes agree with him throughout the history of the church. Um, he doesn't dive too far into um, the patristic sources, uh, his, his one or two quotes from uh, somebody from the fourth or fifth century are sort of secondhand quotes. He's, he relies on the work of Michael Avi to um, sort of explain the patristic testimony. Um, and, and then once he starts to get into people like Charles Hodge, um, sort of people who are more contemporary, um, then he, he starts to do his own assessment and analysis. Um, so I think, uh, you know, I think as you look at it, he just, he demonstrates throughout the chapter that the historical development's not that important to him. Uh, and, and because of that, he shows, as he uses these sources, that he's not really all that competent to do so. The, the way that he uses a lot of these sources just doesn't work when you've, when you've studied historical theology or you do historical theology. Yeah, when, when I read the section in his updated systematic theology where he talks about all these quotes, where he makes it seem like just everybody has agreed with this, and he quotes right. people like uh, Hodge and Bob Inc. and Michael Horton and, right. and on and on. I mean, some of these have also like he did like a control find for the word sub subordination. Right. And uh, yeah, I'm sure they all, you know, obviously they've all used that term in certain senses in their writing, but um, and, and you certainly know more about theology than I do. I'm not aware of any of them who, any of the people I just listed, who their teaching was uh, eternal functional subordination. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that's one of the arguments, um, kind of one of the, it, what would be one of the strongest points that he makes. And it's essentially the same argument. Um, he says something like, uh, this is on, um, this is in the section on the subordination and it's on page 500 in the Kindle edition. He says, um, I have seen no such statement quoted in any of their objections. So are these objections actually an innovation in the early church or in the history of Christian doctrine? And basically, he's he's trying to say uh, that he hasn't seen anyone in the controversy quote a historical figure that lodges the same objections that we do. And this, again, just demonstrates a lack of awareness of how historical theology has developed. Historical theology, the, the history of the church has been such that theology develops predominantly in response to error, right? So we start with the, the Bible and the New Testament. But even within the New Testament, how much of the New Testament, how much of Paul's letters are devoted to responding to an errant teaching? The entire book of Galatians, most of, of First and Second Corinthians, elements of Colossians, First, Second, and Third John are all basically responses to a form of proto-gnosticism, which is a sort of a theology that denies the incarnation. So even, even in the Bible, the, the New Testament documents themselves are predominantly responsive documents. There's a there's a core truth that has been passed down um, from you know by the saints once for all uh, that's defended by the saints and and that's encap scripturated in the Bible, but then as as we go through history, the church makes these leaps forward in doctrinal uh, clarification and doctrinal I don't want to say doctrinal development because that has some baggage with it, but in developing the articulation of how we explain these and clarifying what we mean by these different doctrinal statements, 
it leaps forward every time there's a controversy, right? So, so the Nicene Council in 325 and then the Council of Constantinople in 481 or 381, uh, they're called to respond to an errant teaching. And then we have another similar set of councils over the next couple hundred years. And then there are councils all the way through, and these are almost all called to respond to some sort of errant teaching. And then the big, the big daddy of all of them, the Reformation itself, right? We're all Reformation Christians in, in one sense or another. That is a response to the errant teaching of the, the you know, uh, Roman Catholic Church. And so the idea that nobody in history has ever responded to these objections actually is evidence towards the fact that it could serve two possible options. It could be that Wayne Grudem is right and that this actually was the dominant theology of the church. Or it could mean that nobody in the church has ever said this, so nobody ever had to respond to it. And, and I want to get into some of these quotes because I think I think especially, you know, I, I come from a reformed background. I didn't grow up in a reformed church, but I, I've never been part of this young, restless reform movement. That just isn't my story. Um, but a lot of people who are, are in sort of this, this new Calvinist or coming out of this new Calvinist movement, that movement is kind of on its tail end. But people who kind of cut their teeth on reformed theology by listening to people like John Piper, they've probably read, read Wayne Grudem's Systematic Theology or they're reading it. They see this array of historical sources of, of men that they've, they've heard the names tossed around. Uh, I remember the first time I ever heard of Herman Bovink. I remember somebody said something in a, a Facebook group I was in about, well, Bovink says this. And I was like, who's Bovink? And then I looked it up. I was like, I got to understand this guy because this guy was a huge deal. And so you look and you see a quote by Bovink in here, and it appears to be teaching the same thing that Grudem is. And you're automatically like, well, I guess, I guess this is what reform people believe. But as we go through some of these quotes, um, I'm going to focus on a couple that are, I think, are particularly important to reformed uh, or Calvinist Christians. Um, but really just their historical sources. So any Christian should be concerned with truth and accuracy and properly using sources. I think yeah. we're going to see that he doesn't, they don't actually teach what he's trying, trying to say. Yeah, that'd be great. So the, the first one that caught my attention is actually a quote, and he uses this quote twice in the chapter. It's the same quote. It's the same cut and paste that he, he tosses in there. And, and I'm going to read his entire quote. And I'm going to include what's called diacritical marks. Those are all the different little markings that aren't, aren't verbalized normally, but they say something in the text. And so he starts, uh, he quotes Charles Hodge, and he says, the Nicene doctrine includes one, the principle of subordination of the son to the father and the spirit to the father and the son. This subordination does not imply inferiority, dot, dot, dot. The subordination intended is only that which concerns the mode of subsistence and operation, dot, dot, dot. The creeds are nothing more than a well-ordered arrangement of facts of scripture, which concern the doctrines of the Trinity. They assert the distinct personality of the father, son, and spirit, dot, 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 and their consequent perfect equality and the subordination of the son to the father and of the spirit to the father and the son. So as to the mode of subsistence and operation, these are scriptural facts to which the creeds in question add nothing. And it is in this sense that they have accepted, have been accepted by the church universal. So, one thing that we, uh, you know, if you listen to anybody talking about how to read the Bible, right, the, the, there's three rules to, to biblical interpretation, context, 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 right? It's on my show, what I say is, if you're unsure, or if somebody says something about the Bible, and it seems off, just read a little bit more. Usually, if you read, you know, even usually just a few more verses on either side of a, of a, a quote, it clarifies things, whether it means you understood it wrong and, and the broader context corrects you and then you can move forward or whether it proves that the person talking to you is wrong and, and you can refute them. Either way, it's, it's good to read a little bit more. So when I'm looking at this, I see two things. First of all, it's a, it's a chunk of text ripped out of another one. And there's no real explanation of what, what Hodge means. Grudem is not saying, here's a quote, I'm going to explain what the quote means, and then I'm going to demonstrate that this quote forwards or agrees with my thesis. It's just a, a quote, as though plopping it in the text there with no commentary somehow proves that uh, Hodge is an eternal functional subordination advocate. The second thing uh, is that there's all these dot, dot, dots. And these dot, dot, dots, um, I, I think sometimes, you know, people who are, are in sort of the text messaging generation, dot, dot, dot is, is, doesn't mean anything. It's just the way you end a sentence. Yeah. Um, it's the way you kind of demonstrate that maybe you'll come back to this later. But in, in technical writing, that's called an ellipsis. Um, and 
what it is, is it's a way for an author who's quoting someone else to sort of truncate a quote. And the way it's supposed to be used is you take irrelevant text out of a quote in order to not clutter up your own text. So we'll, we'll talk about the Bovink, the Herman Bovink quote next, but when he's quoting Bovink, he has similar ellipses. And what these do in his, Bovink has like in those ellipses are just scripture citations. So he's just taking those scripture citations out because he doesn't want to clutter up his text and use more paper and pages to do that. But in the Hodge quote, he does something very different. So I went in and I analyzed how this text is used. And when you go back to Hodge's original writing, um, the actual um, length of the quote from the first word that um, that Hodge or that uh, Grudem quotes, which is the Nicene Doctrine, from that until the very last word that he uses universal is something like 900 words. And his actual quotation of it, he eliminates 87% of the text that's there. So I don't have the exact numbers in front of me um, because I, I'm terrible at preparing for podcasts, but more or less he, he quotes less of the quote than there actually is. The, the amount of text that he is eliminating far out, outpaces the amount of text that he's quoting. And now, it, it may be the case that that's a legitimate use of ellipses, right? Uh, yeah. The example I used on my own show when I was explaining this, Karl Barth, uh, who is a thinker kind of on the, the, the very outskirts of the reform world. He's not really a reform thinker, but he exists within the reform tradition. He, in his church dogmatics, which is just ridiculously long already, he often would go on a topic and then it's like he has like a paragraph or sometimes even multiple pages of an, what's called an excursus where it's a totally different subject he's talking about. So he may be talking about the, the inspiration of scripture, and then he goes on this other side note about the Nazi regime and how they're abusing, uh, how they're abusing the scripture. And then he comes back to finish his thought on the inspiration of scripture. So if I was quoting Karl Barth, I may eliminate a page and a half of text and, and dump it into a, an ellipsis because that doesn't have anything to do with the argument that I'm making or, or even the argument that he's making. But if you look at the stuff that he dumps out of Hodge that he buries in this. Uh, right here on the same page, it says, the third point decided concerning the relations of the persons of the Trinity one to another relates to their union. As the essence of the Godhead is common to the several persons, they have a common intelligence, will, and power. There are not three gods, or there is not in God three intelligences, wills, or three efficiencies. The three are one God and therefore have one mind and one will. And so right there in the, um, in the text is something that actually refutes what Grudem is saying. So Grudem, the other thing that I think is really key for this, and, and I, I'm sorry to keep on kind of like doing my own little excursions here, but that's great. Grudem also likes to argue um, kind of by fiat. And what I mean by that is he'll, a critic will say, and this is what Glenn Butner, his cr criticism was, they'll say, well, Dr. Grudem, in order for what you're saying to be true, there have to be multiple wills in the Trinity because uh, submission or subordination, as you're describing it, involves a situation where there's some sort of, even if it's only hypothetical, but there's some sort of tension or diversity or some sort of difference in the, the wills. And so the way that that difference is resolved is by uh, one will acquiescing to the other will. So an example might be, you know, if you wanted to do this recording at five o'clock and I wanted to do it at three o'clock, we might haggle back and forth. And ultimately I might submit to your will and say, okay, well, it's your show. We're going to do it at five o'clock because that's, that's when it works for you. Or you might submit to my will and say, well, you're my guest. I want to acquiesce to you. But either way, one of us has to take our will and release it in order for the other person's will to uh, somehow be resolved. There's also the idea of compromise, but even that requires two different wills. And Grudem acknowledges this because later on when he starts to cite passages to prove this diversity of wills, he, he says more or less that there have to be different wills. And, and so when I say he argues by fiat, he then just sort of invents this phrase uh, where he says, well, it's not different wills, it's different expressions of will. Well, again, like, yeah, we can, we can pile up words on top of things uh, and, and pretend that that resolves the issue. We can pretend that adding the word expressions of to the word wills doesn't somehow postulate multiple wills. 
But the reality is that his theology, the theology he's advocating, requires a plurality of wills. It, it, it just does. And even um, there was a book uh, published by Bruce Ware, who's, who's a close associate of Grudem. He's one of the men who are in this list of evangelical theologians that support his position. Um, he edited a book and one of Bruce Ware's own PhD students put an article in it or an essay in it and said, this theology that's being advocated requires a plurality of wills. And Bruce Ware as the editor did not, did not correct him. He didn't say, no, no, that's not correct. You know, you didn't understand correctly. He didn't publish a response and say, no, no, you don't get it. You don't understand it. He left it stand. Um, and so I think part of the issue is that Br Wayne Grudem doesn't seem to doesn't seem to consistently use terms. He doesn't ever really define a lot of these terms. He sort of just states something, kind of like he just states, I believe the Nicene Creed. Well, do you? Well, I, you know, I'm not saying there's multiple wills. Well, explain how there's not multiple wills. Um, so in this quote, the fact that uh, Hodge is saying right in the middle of this, almost as a qualification of what he's saying, all of this stuff I just said about subordination and order in the Trinity, all of that stuff I just said, has to be understood in light of the fact that there is one will, intellect, and emotion, and, and agency in the Trinity. There's not three wills. There's not three intellects. There's one. Well, Grudem doesn't affirm that in, in any real sense of the word. Um, so he, he's taken this quote. He's flipped it around to mean something other than what it means, and he's hidden that from you. And I don't think I, I wrestle with how to respond to this. I don't think he's doing this nefariously. I don't think he's sitting there, you know, he's not, he's not some mustache villain twirling the end of his mustache, tying the doctrine of the Trinity to the railroad tracks and, you know, rubbing his hands together. I honestly think that the more charitable understanding is just to think he's not competent in this area of theology. He's not competent in understanding these historical sources. Um, the fact that he doesn't go to the seminal sources, he doesn't pull quotes out of Augustine, he doesn't discuss, you know, he quotes Hillier of Portier, but he doesn't explain anything about what that theology means or the context that it was set in or what they're responding to. And, you know, the other thing, um, had he done that, had he done the work to do that, he would understand that the word subordination in its classical sense doesn't have to do with authority and submission. It has to do with ordering and rank and not, not rank in terms of um, priority or superiority. We're not talking about, you know, God is the, the father is the commander and Jesus is the lieutenant. That's not what subordination means. Subordination in these classical sources, both in sources, especially sources that come from Latin, where these words come from, but then sources like Hodge and, um, you know, Burkhoff and Bavink who are using the words in the classical senses, Calvin, Knox, Turretin, they're using these in the Latin sense of the word. And it just means suborder, right? So when we talk about numbers, we have cardinal numbers, which are like one, two, three, those are counting numbers. And we have ordinal numbers, which are first, second, third, they tell you the order of things. When someone like Hodge or Bavink, although Bavink is a translation, but when someone like Hodge is using a technical term like subordination, he's using in that classical sense. So even if he presented this full source, this full thing here, when he says there's a subordination of the father to of the son to the father in the Trinity, and then the spirit to the father and the son, he's not saying anything about authority. He's saying that there's a logical order that must be the case in the Trinity. You, if the son uh, is begotten of the father, the father logically has to be first because otherwise you can't be, you can't be begotten of something that isn't logically prior to you. And if the spirit proceeds from the father and the son, then the father and the son have to be logically prior. So that's what he's getting at. And this is just a really bad misuse of text. It's really frustrating to read it because, you know, I used to hold this position where I thought Wayne Grudem's systematic theology, you know, it has its problems, you know, his, his Trinity theology, maybe you just skip that chapter and, you know, maybe maybe when you get to the new mythology and he starts talking about gifts of the spirit, he gets a little sideways there. But, you know, the stuff on the scripture, the stuff on the incarnation and, and on the, you know, the, the doctrines of grace, five point Calvinism, that stuff's pretty good. So go ahead and read that. But he does this to historical quotes. And, and what you see when you look at the way he uses biblical quotes, he does the same thing where he rips, he rips them out of context and just drops them down as though just quoting a passage um, somehow settles the argument. Um, so, I, I mean, I don't want to like belabor that point on this Hodge one, but the Hodge one is just such a, such an example of this abuse of historical sources that in my mind, it actually calls into question any other historical source he's quoted. 
there are some guys here, like he quotes J.I. Packer, right? And and the, the Hillary quote that he pulls that he's quoting kind of secondhand from Michael Ovi, those are those are legit quotations, right? Hillary says as much as Hillary is great on the Trinity, he also says some weird squirrely stuff about the Trinity. And this is part of it. Um, J.I. Packer was an EFS advocate. Like he, he was, he's a lot right along with Wayne Grudem and Bruce Ware. So some, some of this stuff is just frustrating to read because it just sort of undermines the whole project. Even if he's quoting someone who does hold his view, it starts to make you wonder, is he quoting them accurately? Is he quoting them correctly? Or is he abusing what they've said in order to demonstrate his point? That's very helpful. And especially explaining the uh, different ways how people throughout history might've used the word subordination 